Let me invite you to take out your message notes that look like this. You'll find them inside your, uh, your bulletin. And we'll use those to kind of follow with us. We're going to be in two different places this morning. So if you can uh, find Psalm 51, if you have your Bible. And then also in 2 Samuel 12. Uh, we're going to start with Psalm 51. Then we're going to work our way back through 2 Samuel 12. When, when I was 10 years old... I got caught in a terrible, terrible lie. Now, it wasn't terrible because it was so hurtful. And it wasn't terrible because it was so far-fetched. The lie was so terrible because it was so completely unnecessary. One summer day, my family and I came home from a little overnight fishing trip. We were out in the driveway cleaning up a, a boat and kind of putting away our fishing supplies. And at one point, I was alone in the driveway when the man who lived next door to us, James, noticed me. And he came over to say hi. And he asked what we had been up to. Now, at that point, all I had to say was, we went on a little fishing trip, which would have been completely true. But instead, for some reason, I heard these words come out of my mouth. I said, we went on a fishing trip for my birthday. Now, I knew this wasn't true. It was June. My birthday is in February. The trip had nothing to do with my birthday or even specifically me, I guess. But I, I just thought that maybe somehow that made the whole thing sound better, more interesting, more exciting that it had been my birthday. Well, we finished up the conversation. James went back into his house. I went back into my house. And just to be completely honest with you, I forgot all about it. That is until uh, the doorbell rung about an hour later. And I, you know, went to the door, little 10-year-old Justin, and I opened the door up, and, and there stands James, my neighbor, and his wife, Janice, with big smiles on their faces and a bright green birthday card in their hand. And Janice begins to tell me how bad she felt when she found out that they had forgotten my birthday and that she and James just ran right out and got me a card with a little gift in it. And sure enough, I opened a card, and there was a $20 bill. And this was like 1985, and, and listen, $20 bill was a pretty big deal, okay, for a 10-year-old. And, and, and let me just ask you this, don't you just hate nice people, <laughs> right? They're the worst. Well, I was able to, <laughs> I was kind of able to rush James and Janice off as fast as I could, but as I turn around to go figure out what to do with this card and this money, I run right into my mom. And she sees the card, and she sees the money, and she wants to know what's going on. Now, being the godly young man that I was, do I come clean with her? Do I tell her the truth? No way. I lie through my teeth. I told her those crazy neighbors of ours, they just dropped off a birthday card and some money for some reason. I have no idea why. I don't know what they're doing. Well, as you can guess... She wasn't buying that for a second. Ultimately, she marched me over next door and, and, and made me knock on the door, made me tell them what I had done, and I cannot explain to you the humiliation of having to admit to my neighbors that I had lied to them. I mean, it's still deep, okay? I still remember it. It was bad. It was a foundational moment for me. Not only that, but she made me apologize to them. I remember this three times. Because the first time was one of those mumbled, you know, I'm sorry kind of deals, right? I'm sorry. Now the second attempt was better, but still not good enough for my mom. So right there in front of my neighbor, she explained to me that those kind of apologies were for this kind of bad behavior, okay? You might get away with that, but the kind of behavior that I had displayed required this kind of apology, and so the last time, I really did apologize, and, and I really did mean it. I felt terrible about it. And in that situation, I think I learned a couple of things that were really important. First of all, I learned that no matter how convinced you are that you've gotten away with something, your sin will always find you out, right? And I learned that there is a big difference between I'm sorry and true repentance, 
Now, would you agree with me that, that this can be a struggle for us in our relationship and in our spiritual lives as well? This issue of, I'm sorry, versus true repentance. And here's why. I think because for too long we've been taught that all that's required for us as Christians to deal with sin is a little forgiveness prayer that's about this deep. Right? Right? Now, my mom wasn't impressed with that kind of apology from me, and I doubt that God is impressed with that kind of prayer from us, because again, there is a big difference between a prayer that looks like this and one that looks like this. And that is the difference between forgiveness and repentance. Now, the word repentance is actually an agricultural term. The way they used it in the original language worked like this. I'm a farmer, and I'm out plowing my field with my team of oxen, okay? And I plow one long row, and when I get to the end of the row, to the end of the field, what am I going to do? Am I going to keep plowing off into the brush? Am I going to stop plowing because I've run out of field? No, I am going to lead my oxen to, guess what? Repent. That's exactly right. I'm going to lead them to repent. We're going to repent of the direction that we were going. We're going to turn around and we're going to go in the exact opposite direction. Do you kind of see the idea behind the word? To repent means to stop going in the direction you were going, to turn around and to go in the opposite direction. So in a spiritual context, to repent means I recognize the way in which I have sinned. I stop the behavior which is displeasing to God and with God's help, I make a commitment to go in the exact opposite direction spiritually. That is what repentance means and that is very different, listen to me now, that is very different from simply saying, God forgive me, I'm sorry. Well in Psalm 51, a very special chosen man of God began to cry out to God about his sin. And as we read what he wrote during that time, I want you to decide if this is a prayer of forgiveness, I'm sorry God, or a a prayer of true repentance. Here's what he says. Again, this is Psalm 51 beginning in verse 1. He says, Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sin. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me, God, from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment that my mother conceived me, but you desire honesty from the womb teaching me wisdom even there. So purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back the joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence. And don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to rebels and they will repent and they will return to you. Now, I think you'd agree that would be a pretty powerful prayer no matter who prayed it. Amen? And in fact, you could probably imagine that was a prayer of the prodigal son, couldn't you? You could see how that might be his prayer to his father. So imagine how astounding it would be to find out that this particular prayer was the prayer of David, son of Jesse, king of Israel, chosen servant of God, known to history as a man, as I've told you, after God's own heart. We're in week four of our five-week series, Searching for a King, where we're learning about the characters and qualities God is looking for in those who follow him. Last week, I told you the story of how David put himself in a position where he would learn the hard way about how serious and destructive the consequences of sin can be. 
I told you that in the spring when kings went out to war, David instead stays home. He's out on the roof one night, when, or one day, when he sees a beautiful woman named Bathsheba bathing. He has her brought to him. He has sex with her. And despite the fact that he knows that he is sinning against God, he does it. It turns out she's married to a man named Uriah, who was one of David's most loyal officers in the army. He calls the soldier home. He tries to trick him into sleeping with his own wife so that he'll think that he's the one who made her pregnant. But when that does not work, David resorts to murder. He sends Uriah back to the battlefield. He orders that he be put at the front of the fighting so that he's sure to be killed. And he is. David then marries Bathsheba. She gives birth to a son. And so when David falls on his face before God and he prays this powerful prayer of brokenness in Psalm 51, I just read to you, it is pretty easy to see that something has changed in his heart. Yes? Between the time that he committed these sins and the time when he cries out to God, that something that happened is that God chose to help David see his sin from God's perspective. You see, when we only look at our sin from our perspective, we will never deal with our sin as God requires. The problem is that from our perspective, since grace is free, it makes it seem like forgiveness is cheap. Does that make sense? Even though nothing could be further from the truth. Forgiveness carries an incredibly steep cost. In David's time, it was the sacrifice of an animal. The Bible actually says that apart from the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And then, of course, in the New Testament, it was Jesus who went to the cross in order to purchase our forgiveness and our salvation. And I believe it was that cost that David was actually feeling when he cries out to God in Psalm 51. Did you notice that David uses every possible kind of description for being cleansed? Purge me, God. Wash me. Cleanse me. Use any means possible, but oh God, whatever you must do, deal with my sin. I can't handle it anymore. Now let me ask you a question this morning. When was the last time that the intensity of your sin as God saw it began to just grip you? That words failed you and tears flowed because of what you understood from the heart of God? You know, for some of us, we can remember exactly when that was and how that felt because it was yesterday or it was last week or it was last month. We are incredibly aware of the pain and the reality of our sin because of the way it's affecting our lives and the lives of people we love right here, right now. For others, the intensity of the pain associated with our sin has faded over time, hasn't it? Either it's been a while since we've really stumbled over our sin or more likely we've never really understood the consequences of sin in the first place. So we're just not that aware of it most of the time. Well, I want you to go with me for a second to that moment when God confronted David with his sin so that we can understand exactly how serious it is, the significance of repentance and how we truly receive forgiveness. I want to show you three things that we must recognize and understand about sin and repentance. Here's the first. The first is that God always sees our sin. This is important for us to understand. God always sees our sin. Now the only reason that David could sin the way he did and then go for so long without truly dealing with it was that he didn't think that God knew. Believe it or not, he forgot that God was there, which is not a good sign for the king of God's people, is it? But God says, David, I want you to know something. What you did in secret, I'm going to expose before the whole nation. Everybody is going to know about your sin, and not just here today. Think about this. I'm going to let every generation of my people read about your sin for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Think about that for a moment. What we need to see is that when we sin, God knows it. 
And he desperately wants us to see it the way he sees it so that we can deal with it the only way that sin can truly be dealt with. But when David took Bathsheba to be his wife and he killed her husband Uriah, you kind of get the feeling that maybe David thought he had gotten away with it, right? That, that everything was going to be okay because God didn't come to confront him until almost a year after he had done what he did. Do you realize that? See, we tend to think of all these events as taking place one right after the other. The adultery, the murder, the confrontation, the repentance. But that is not the case. Almost a year had passed. And how do we know that, by the way? Well, in seminary, I learned that in this ancient Middle Eastern culture, when a woman got pregnant, it took nine months for a baby to be born. Okay? And so nine months after the story we read last week had taken place, God had still not confronted David. But don't miss what was going to happen. Don't misread that like David did. Don't think that because God hasn't yet dealt with your sin that he's not going to. Don't ever take comfort and say, well, I guess, you know, it was okay with God what I did. I had an affair but God hasn't done anything to judge me yet. I cheated my company, but nothing has happened to make me think that God is unhappy with me. No, no, be very careful that you see sin from God's perspective. Now, in the 12th chapter of 2 Samuel, so if you've got that marked, you can turn there. God sends the prophet Nathan to David. And we're gonna begin in verse one. Again, this is uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse one. It says this. So the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to tell David this story. There were two men in a certain town. One was rich, one was poor. The rich man owned great many sheep and cattle. The poor man owned nothing but one little lamb he had bought. He raised that little lamb and it grew up with his children. It ate from the man's own plate and drank from his cup, which is kind of weird, I think we would agree. He cuddled it in his arms like a baby daughter. It's, it's getting worse. One day, a guest arrived at the home of the rich man, but instead of killing an animal from his own flock or herd, he took the poor man's lamb and killed it and prepared it for his guest. Now, David was furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed, any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one that he stole and for having no pity. And then David said to, I'm sorry, then Nathan said to David, you are the man. And it was at that moment when David finally came face to face with his sin from God's perspective. And that was the moment when David finally understood how serious what he did was. Now, it's easy for us to look at the story of David and Bathsheba and say to ourselves, well, how could he not know how serious it was? How could he not think that God was going to punish him? But remember, it's very difficult for most of us to see our sin in the mirror. Most of us are world-class justifiers. Do you know what I'm talking about? Is it possible that after David committed his sins, he actually felt sorry for what he had done? And then maybe, you know, he kind of felt the weight of guilt pressed down on his heart just as we have felt so many times in our lives? Maybe he even sent up a little, you know, I'm sorry, God prayer, Heavenly Father, I think I've messed up here, please forgive me. Did that make him immediately feel better? Probably not. But remember the, the saying, Time heals all wounds. So as time passed and no consequences came, wouldn't it be pretty natural for David to conclude, well, I guess everything is going to be okay. I guess God forgave me, right? Look, I guarantee you I've prayed those kind of prayers before and I bet you have too. Oops, <laughs> that wasn't very godly. Father, forgive me. Sorry about that. Uh-oh, I shouldn't have said that. God... Forgive me, I, 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 I know better than that. But see, here's the problem. The Bible does not teach us that we receive forgiveness because we feel sorry for what we did. And it never says that we're forgiven because we feel guilty. What the Bible does tell us 
is that there is no forgiveness without repentance of sin. That's what the Bible actually says. Now maybe David had been fooling himself all those months. Maybe he really thought God had forgotten what he had done. But when David came face to face with God, all of a sudden he saw his sin as God saw it and there was no doubt as to the seriousness of the situation. Here's what God says to David through the prophet Nathan in 2 Samuel 12, verses seven and eight. God says, I anointed you king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. I gave you your master's house and his wives and the kingdoms of Israel and Judah and if that had not been enough, I would have given you much, much more. He's saying, David, you've got to see yourself in the context of my grace. You've got to stop looking at yourself as king. The whole world doesn't revolve around you. He says, you've sinned against everything I did for you. And the sad part is, if you had wanted more, I would have done even more for you. He goes on in verse 9. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord? Why have you done this terrible deed? For you have murdered Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites and stolen his wife. He was saying, David, your sin was absolute rebellion against every commandment I've given. You knew I said do not commit adultery. You knew how serious it is to covet your neighbor's wife and possessions. You knew you weren't allowed to bear false witness. And if that wasn't enough, murder? I... I mean, David, you just went right down the list, didn't you? God says, David, you have done evil, and I was watching you the entire time. See, we've got to understand that forgiveness and healing and health and our relationship with God will not come until we understand that every sin is against what we know to be the will of God. Then comes one of the judgments of God, verses 10. Through 12. He goes on to say, From this time on, your family will live by the sword because you have despised me for taking, by taking Uriah's wife to be your own. This is what the Lord says Because of what you have done, I will cause your own household to rebel against you. I will give your wives to another man before your very eyes, and he will go to bed with them in public view. You did it secretly, but I will make this happen to you openly and in the sight of all Israel. And guess what? It happened. It happened. Folks, the moment that you sin, you open yourself to be treated in the same way that you have treated God. I want you to think about that. David had killed Uriah with the sword, and now God says that the sword would plague his house and family for the rest of his life. I've got to wonder if some of the problems that we're facing today as individuals, as families, as a nation, are partially the result of what we've done in the past. It's a biblical principle that Jesus taught often. You have treated your brother this way, and now you will be treated this way. And I'll be honest with you, there have been times where I've complained to God about something that was happening in my life, and I felt like God was saying back to me, hey, don't complain to me. What you're experiencing in your life is simply the outcome of what you did in the past. God says to David, you killed Uriah with a sword and now I want you to know that a sword will never depart from your house. Generations will suffer, David, because of what you've done. And why? Because you convinced yourself that what you'd done was no big deal. And then that brings us to our final takeaway, number three. We must see sin as God sees it not as we want him to see it, okay? We must see sin as God sees it, not as we want him to see it. In verse 11, God asks David, why have you despised me and done this horrible thing? Now let me ask you a question. Is that how we see our sin? Imagine after committing one of of my million daily sins, if God were to speak to me and, and ask, Justin, why do you despise me? First of all, can you even imagine God saying that to you? Justin, why do you despise me? Why do you hate me so much? How do you think I would respond to that? You know what I'd say. I'd say, but God, I don't despise you, right? I I love you, God. I don't hate you. I love you. I, I just, I just sinned. That's all I did. 
he'd say, Justin, you better see your sin as I see it, not as you want me to see it. When you sin, you have despised me. When you sin, you have hated my word. I made clear to you what was sin to me. I placed my Holy Spirit inside of you, and in my presence, you went ahead and you sinned against me anyway. He told David, you've despised every part of our relationship in order to continue covering up everything that you have done. Then comes the moment that I think David had been expecting for at least nine months. Here's David's response to all of this. The confrontation, the accusation, the judgment. Verse 13, David confessed to Nathan and he said, I have sinned against the Lord. Now, that is, I think, one of the most important moments in all the Bible. Finally, David gets it right. After all that he had done, he gets it right. Finally, he, think, he, he thinks he understands how serious what he did was. And Nathan even gives him some good news in verse 12. Nathan replies, yes, but the Lord has forgiven you, and you won't die for this sin. Now, let me ask you, in the Old Testament law of God, what was the consequence for adultery? Death. What was the consequence for murder? Death. But Nathan says, God knows your heart, David, and you will not die. Should he have died, yes or no? Yes. Did he deserve to die? Yes. King or not, David had basically earned himself back-to-back -back death sentences. Now do you understand why David's first words in Psalm 51 were, Have mercy on me, O God. Have mercy on me according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Because God had every right to take his life, but in his grace he agrees to give David the exact opposite of what he deserved. He agreed to not let David die. So, it's amazing. Everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to work out in the end, right? Wrong. Remember when I said there's no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood, the taking of life? Well, David's about to learn just how costly sin really is. Verse 14. Nevertheless, because you have shown utter contempt for the Lord by doing this, your child will die. That's right. You read it correctly. For nine months, David thought he'd gotten away with it. For nine months, a baby grew in Bathsheba's womb. But when God finally confronts David with his sin, he says that the consequences are not just going to be what happens in the future. The consequences are going to take place right here, right now, right in front of your face in the worst possible way that you can imagine. The baby born to Bathsheba, just seven days old, a little boy, by the way, becomes sick and dies. Now, I'll be honest with you. When I read that, I just feel like weeping. I mean, the thought that David's sin, that my sin, could be so serious and so horrible before the Lord, it breaks my heart. Now, this is a very difficult passage. Let me take a second to explain what is and what is not happening here, okay? From time to time, I will come across Christians who somehow believe that because Jesus died for us, that there is no longer any consequence for our sin. And that's half right. Trusting Jesus as our Savior means that there will be no eternal consequences for sin, but the Bible never says that there will be no earthly consequences for sin. So let me carefully say that the passage we just read is one of, of many that backs that argument up. There are consequences for our sin. Which means that yes, God allowed this baby to die as a direct result of David's sin. However, and be sure you listen to the rest of what I'm saying. Don't tune me out after I said that, okay? However, this does not in any way suggest that all babies or children or loved ones who die, die as a result of somebody else's sin. Do you hear me? It's important that you don't walk out with a misunderstanding about that. And here's something else to remember. I said earlier that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin, right? 
Well, when Jesus, God's son, God's child, died on the cross, he conquered both sin and death, and therefore, he made it unnecessary, listen to me, for anyone to ever have to die for sin again. Does that, does that make sense? And he had not done that yet when this baby died. So while this passage is very difficult to accept, and maybe even harder to understand, what I want you to take away from it is this. This passage is meant to hit home for us in, I think, the most uncomfortable way possible that sin is a serious issue for God. And therefore, it needs to be a serious issue for us. So here's the question. Do you understand the consequences of sin? Are you looking at sin from God's perspective or from your own? You know, what happens so many times is that instead of seeing sin as God sees it, we start reshaping God into the God we want him to be. And that's not right. We've got to go back to seeing sin as God sees it, not as we want him to see it. Listen, it's time for us to stop justifying our sin and start seeing it the way he does. It's time for us to recapture the passion of, of reaching out to lost and hurting people with the good news that forgiveness is available. You say, how do we do these things? Where, where do we start? You know what? We start where David did in Psalm 51. On our knees. Right now. Not later. Not when it's convenient. Not when it's comfortable. Right now. I asked Jamie to come and sing a song this morning that she wrote that comes directly from Psalm 51. It's, it's David's prayer of repentance. And the reason I asked her to sing it is that I want you to hear not only the words of David's repentance, I want you to feel the emotion of it. I want you to experience the pain and the guilt and the peace and the joy that's all wrapped up together in these words. Have mercy on me, O oh God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. transgressions and wash away all my iniquity cleanse me from all my sin against you and you only have I sinned remember me Never be in your compassion. 
Son, it's the prayer of King David, and it needs to be our prayer. Do you understand? Repentance does not come from saying, hey, I'm sorry, God. It comes from a much, much deeper place. Will you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you, first of all, for giving us exactly what we do not deserve. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. What a, what a waste it would be if we didn't walk out of here understanding that and proclaiming that this morning. And now, God, will you speak to our hearts? I pray for those whose sin and the consequences of sin are fresh. Maybe in the last day or week or month, they've been dealing with it, dealing with the pain that they've caused. I pray for those maybe whose the pain has faded a little bit. It's been a while and maybe they've not been confronted yet. Maybe they've even thought that you've forgotten. God, you haven't forgotten. You don't forget. You know. And our sin will find us out. So I pray that they would deal with that this morning. And not just with a simple, I'm sorry. But God, with repentance, turning and going in the opposite direction. Receiving true forgiveness from you. I pray for someone here this morning who doesn't know you. And I hope that, that they hear judgment. I hope that they hear sin and consequences of sin. But more than that, I pray and I hope that they hear grace and mercy. And that it's available for every single person, no matter what you have done. Even an adulterer, a murderer like David, received your grace, God. I pray for those who might have other decisions or commitments weighing on their heart. Maybe today is the day that, uh, that they would choose to follow through on that, to act on that. God, will you give them courage to be obedient to you. We love you, God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Just stand with me. It's Jamie Lee's that's helping here this morning. You need someone to pray with you. Thank you. 
a place where you're struggling because of a choice or a decision that you've made, because of, of a sin that you have committed, and whether it's fresh or whether it's far in the past, if you've not dealt with it, I have a feeling that if you ask your Heavenly Father to show it to you, I, I have a feeling He will. And I pray that you take a moment right now and deal with it. And it may even just be the beginning of dealing with it. Think of that farmer plowing that field, coming to the end, turning around and going in the opposite direction. Think in those terms as you admit your sin, as you confess it, as you recognize the pain and the destruction that it causes, not just in your life, but in your relationship with your Heavenly Father. As you confess it, repent, ask for His help to turn completely in the opposite direction. Ask for His help to replace it with something that is godly and pleasing to Him. Ask for forgiveness. God, take my sin far, far, far away. And then finally, give thanks. Give thanks to a Heavenly Father who is gracious and who is merciful and who loves you in ways that you will never comprehend. Sing that praise to Him. Your sins are many. His mercy is one. Or riches of kindness. Sing this together. Or riches.